Christmas will be green and bright. The sun will shine by day and all the stars at night. Melikaluki Maka is Hawaii's way to say a Merry Christmas to you. Hello and welcome to Not Just Paleo. I'm your host, Evan Brand, Certified Functional Medicine Practitioner. Now, today we're going to be talking about smart drugs, nootropics, memory enhancers, brain juice, whatever you want to call it. It's a very exciting field of research that is still a little bit like the Wild West, but it's becoming more mainstream every day, which excites me because we're breaking a lot of new ground in Let's face it, the population is aging and we need to be able to support our brains. So we're going to talk about how we can do that today. This podcast also celebrates the launch of my new book that is with a publishing company that is called The Everything Guide to Nootropics. It is the first piece of paper that you will ever find that is published by me that has a cookbook attached to it. It took me a very long time, but half of this book is basically brain healthy recipes and then the other half is all about different mushrooms, different herbs, different supplements, vitamins, nutrients, nutraceuticals, smart drugs, nootropics, everything that has to do with improving your brain prow nope. Sounds like I need some, don't I? Improving your brain power, your memory, your focus, etc. Once again, that's called the Everything Guide to Nootropics. I make about a dollar plus some change. So it's not necessarily a money grabber book. But you should definitely have it on your shelf. So check that out at Amazon.com. Just look up Evan Brand or look up Nootropic Book. If you want to schedule a free consult with me to discuss your health goals and symptoms, do that back at the website, notjustpaleo.com. Jesse, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Hey, so tell people a little bit about your podcast. I found your podcast several years ago you and I have both been on the air for a pretty long time in terms of podcasting which is which is impressive get people up to speed on your show yeah well I've got a podcast called smart drug smarts so we figured I get smart in the title twice there and basically it's an interview based show we come out it, for the last I think year and a half it's been weekly at first it was a little bit more patchwork quilt of sometimes there were episodes sometimes there weren't but um, every week I'm interviewing somebody that works in some branch of neuroscience a lot of it is like university researchers and biochemists and folks like that. Some of the people are marketing people. I mean, we've talked with attorneys about the legality of you know shipping supplements internationally and things like that. But I'd say probably a good fifty percent of the episodes are about you know something that you put in your mouth, whether it's a uh, like an adaptogen plant or some sort of synthetic pill to um, you know affect your brain function. And then you know maybe the other fifty percent are about things that are tangentially related to cognition, but are kind of the uh, things Jesse finds interesting episodes. Exactly. So we are both huge fans of adaptogens. What is your favorite? Um, Gosh, whew, tough one. I, I guess I'm going to go with rhodiola rosea nice. as, as my default answer, but um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a crowded field. I know it is. Love it. Okay, so how did you get into smart drugs, adaptogens, plants, was there a particular period of your life that led you to, gosh, I need to fix myself, or how did that how did that come about? No, I mean, I was a um, software development guy, you know, going back 15, 20 years. I mean, when I, when I popped out of university, it was with a, a software engineering degree, and I've, I've worked in that on and off, you know, pretty much my entire adult life. And as you probably know, there's, a, you know, a big crossover between people that work in software and people that are interested in cognitive enhancement and nootropics because it really is one of these roles where you want to be able to you know sit in you know one spot for eight or nine or ten hours even though that's not very great for you physically and just really mentally bear down on some problems and hold a lot of variables in your head at one time and kind of remember what you're doing shut the world out and kind of engage in this you know like deep focus you know dopamine binge sort of behavior and it was probably I think like nine years ago now that I came across a little sidebar article in, I'm pretty sure it was Maxim Magazine that was talking about this thing called Provigil. And, and it's just saying like, oh, this is something that some you know, really out there computer programmers are using for extreme periods of uh, you know, complete focus, even though it's meant to be used for people that are narcoleptics and are falling asleep without warning. And, and that just you know, really piqued my curiosity because here I was, I was a computer programmer and I just, I'd never even heard of the concept of you know, any drug that really like upregulated your brain behavior versus just, you know, making you, you know, the silly goofy guy with a lampshade at your head on your head at a party. 
And so I was curious about it. It sounded a little bit like, you know, under the table, like you didn't necessarily have to go to a doctor. You could order it online from one of these Canadian pharmacies. And it, it just sounded so, uh, so intriguing to me. I did a little bit of research and I ordered my first jar probably like a week after that and kind of, you know, felt like I was doing something slightly naughty. But, um, but yeah, Probagil is, is the trade name or the, the you know, name that it's officially marketed under for the drug that most people know as modafinil. And that was probably like my initial foray into anything that was a cognitive enhancer other than caffeine, of course, and kind of started me down this road of curiosity. Yeah, that's great. And I just went on Dave Asprey's Bulletproof show and, you know, he's, that was his first entry, I believe, into smart drugs too, is modafinil or Provigil that he talked about on CNN, which is kind of funny because now there's so many more options available to people. Yeah, I, I think the way that, uh, you know, they talk about marijuana being sort of a gateway drug into harder drugs in the recreational realm, it, it's probably pretty true that modafinil is sort of the uh, the gateway drug equivalent for the, the smart drugs in nootropics world, if there is such a thing. Right. Now, have you ever interviewed, I think you may have, have you had Dr. Andrew Hill on your podcast yet? Yeah, yeah, a couple times. He was actually one of our, our very first guests um, you know, back in, in 2013. Because he told a crazy story about his reaction i guess he took modafinil for a couple weeks and then eventually he had he was in the hospital with rashes and all sorts of stuff did you ever hear about that um i i don't know if i've spoken with him about that but if so he's the second person who i know personally that has had a negative um you know skin reaction from modafinil and and i think it's about one percent of the population actually which you know while it's not a huge number it's, it's not too small either that does have a um, you know a significant negative reaction that way. It's definitely not for everybody. Right. Well, one of the shows that you did that I really enjoyed was about lemon balm. Do you currently use lemon balm? Do you rotate it in your stash of nootropics seasonally, or how do you how do you use it? Yeah, that's a great question. The the only reason I'm not using lemon balm right now is just because I ran out of it and I haven't restocked. <laughs> but um, I think lemon balm probably has the um, you know, distinction of being the only cognitive enhancer that I've ever tried that actually you know, could be a condiment unto itself. It actually tastes good. Actually, let me take that back because curcumin is, is another one that actually tastes great and you can you know, just put in your cooking. But um, yeah, lemon balm, from, from the interview that I did, it, it, basically the cognitive enhancement properties are fairly minimal. There, there, you know, some studies have shown some small um, you know, benefits for your, your actual thinking. Others have been, you know, so-so. Nobody th- seems to think it hurts you. But um, the, uh, the benefits that do seem a little bit more profound are, are it's a slight mood upregulator. So if you're, uh, you know, kind of having a blue day or you just want to be in a slightly better mood, lemon balm seems to help. And the fact that it tastes great doesn't hurt either. Yeah, because lemon balm works on the GABA receptors, right? Yeah, yeah, it's um, you know, it tends to s- smooth you out, make you feel a little bit more, uh, I-, I guess, just like chilled and-, and happy. And see, the thing that's fun about this whole conversation is that there's so many different old, like ancient nootropics, and then there's all these new nootropics, and I always find myself being more passionate and interested in these more, I guess, ancient or um, ancestral style nootropics. What about yourself? Well, as, as a paleo guy, I think you, you kind of have to. Um, <laughs> right. And the, the nice thing about everything that is old is that if it was going to do something truly horrible and devastating to people, we would know about it already. So something that's been invented in the last 15, 20 years, you know, even if it's been through the FDA trials, which is you know, typically like a five-year process, you know, they don't really know if maybe you know, 40 years later your liver drops out or, or something like that. Where something like lemon balm or you know rhodiola rosea or bacopa you know that have been around since the dawn of time you know since before we had written history, um, th- they probably don't have quite as profound effects except in maybe in really large doses as some of the things that have you know been more recently chemically synthesized. But we do know a lot more about their long term uh, you know safety features, which is definitely a nice thing. Yeah. So you told me before the call you're up in Oregon for just a few days. What is your seasonal, what is your seasonal supplement plan like while you're up there? Um, well, the one thing, like I mentioned, is uh, because we don't have a heck of a lot of sunshine this time of year in Oregon. I'm I'm definitely supplementing with some extra uh, vitamin D3, which is something that I do quite frequently anyway. Because, like everybody else, I'm indoors more of my life than I probably should be. And if if you're not getting you know hours of sun on your 
your bare skin every day, then probably having some D3 is not a bad thing. I don't do a huge amount of seasonal regulation of what I'm having. Um, it, it's more sort of a day in, day out, week in, week out change. Um, and that's not to say that seasonal rotation isn't a great idea. It's probably just sort of because I'm, I'm still in a research phase with a lot of things and haven't settled into what I think is going to be my you know, lifetime plan for my diet or lifetime plan for supplementation. It's like I'm still kind of on the fence between do I want to eat um, you know, like a ketogenic diet for a few months a year and then switch back to something like a paleo or um, you know, would I actually want to gamble with doing ketogenic you know, for a long-term diet even though I don't like the taste of it as much. Um, so, so a lot of those things are still kind of works in progress for me. That's cool. So, And then you're going to be traveling too. So what's, what comes to mind when you're like, oh man, I want to make sure that I'm staying on top of my health while traveling. Like for me, I love to take some rhodiola or I'll even take some, some gabina agonist, maybe some lemon balm or maybe occasionally some finibute for, for traveling. Is there like a travel stack that you're going to be delving into? Yeah, actually rhodiola rosea is a great one because it is sort of a, a general, you know, anti-stress. If you're not getting enough sleep, if you're, you know, maybe fighting some germs from sitting in an airplane with a bunch of other coughing people, um, it, you know, it, it seems to be a, a general booster to, you know, any sort of immune system issues. Uh, they, uh, I think the interview I did on it, that what stood out in my mind is that it was something that uh, the Russian military, when they were invading Afghanistan in the 1980s, they um, used it quite religiously with their troops who were in these you know, very, very tough, you know, foxholes in the mountains sort of conditions. I was like, wow, that's that's a memorable anecdote. I'll need to really stick with that one. Um, but yeah, so I'd, I'd say for travel. A combination of, of rhodiola rosea, um, sometimes using um, modafinil or armodafinil to kind of reacclimate to the time zone. If it's a if it's a big time zone switch, that can certainly help. And I actually, um, this isn't a a nootropic related thing or a, a really drug related at all. But I did pick up a cool um, travel hack for changing time zones. If that's something you're interested in, totally. Is it going to be about grounding? Um, no, well, unless grounding is something that I, is, is that where you're like letting your feet touch the ground? So you pick up, uh, like some sort of, uh, yeah, well, I thought you mentioned Asia and I, and I talked before with my dad, he used to fly over to China a lot. And when he would go over there, I would tell him, look, just go find some grass as soon as you get over there and ground yourself with your bare feet and it'll help with jet lag. And he reported incredible results. So I was thinking maybe that was like your, your hack, but I'm, I'm still intrigued. What is it? Yes. So, so this one um, is actually more about the, the denial of food. So uh, one of the things I, I've toyed around with over the course of the last year is fasting. But one interesting thing where fasting can actually be applied to travel is um, – so, so here, here's, here's – I'll give you the hack first and then tell you how, how it works, why it works. Is probably about six hours before you get on the plane, maybe earlier if, you're, if you've got the willpower for it, just, just stop eating. So let yourself get hungry. Uh, do not eat while you're traveling at all. Wait until you get on the ground in the new location. Wait until dinner time there. So depending on how long your flight is, this, this could be a, a pretty long fast, like maybe a period of even 30 hours or so. Um, but wait until you're at dinner time at the new location. Then eat a big meal as much as you want and go to sleep immediately after that. And, and the reason that this works, and I tried this a couple times and it does work pretty well, is that you know, if you start fasting you know, maybe 12 hours or so before your flight, your body, you start to get hungry, of course, and your body as an animal, it kind of thinks, oh, my, this animal is starting to starve. If I shouldn't go to sleep now, even if I think it's time to sleep because maybe I'll starve to death. And so, so basically the, the being hungry kind of keeps you awake, helps you, you know, stave off falling asleep early on the wrong time zone. But then once you finally do have a dinner in the normal time zone, you've kind of gorged yourself. Your body's like, okay, now it's time to shut off. And it really helps you kind of restabilize on the new time zone much more easily. That actually makes perfect sense. I've talked about fasting before. So it sounds like you're probably getting a cortisol spike there. And then maybe when you're getting that food in, assuming you're probably getting some carbs in with that dinner, you're going to boost up the tryptophan and then boom, now you have serotonin and then boom, you have melatonin and then you sleep like a rock. Exactly. Knocks you out. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So yeah, it, it can be tough because I mean you have to sort of say no to all the the travel food that you could be eating along the way. But if you're willing to do it, it can definitely take some time off the long uh, long time zone shifts. Right. I typically don't do too much fasting or too much traveling beyond three time zones. But if you're traveling as far as you do, that sounds like a a pretty helpful strategy. Yeah, it can be a good one. Now, are you doing magnesium and stuff like that too during that, or 
or do you not geek out too much? You're just ready to get where you're going. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm generally, you know, I, I can't say that I, I'm hugely uh, like I don't have a completely different stack for travel. I just sort of look at what's you know in the med- medicine cabinet for that day, and you know maybe alter things slightly. So let's talk about maybe your top three or top five. We talked about rhodiola, which you and I both. I mean, that was my first taste of like, oh, the endurance that you can have as a human and not be stressed. This is amazing. And then I sort of branched out into some other herbs and ashwagandhas and ginsengs and eleutheros and all of that. But what would you say your blanket statement is for people? Maybe for people that are not ready to delve into more of the synthetic type of nootropics, but they are ready for the more paleo-inspired ones. What would what would your blanket recommendations be? Uh, let's see. There's something called phosphatidylserine, which is a, uh, a naturally occurring compound. I think that they're if, if I remember right, they used to be getting it from cow's brains, yeah. but now they're getting it from a, from something that's a little less uh, scary sounding than that. But this is a naturally occurring compound within the human body, but it's one of these things that if you supplement with and sort of top up your supply, that can have some benefits. Um, it, it, as I remember, it increases membrane permeability for nerve cells, for brain cells, and um, basically you know, it helps those things. Uh, yeah, they switched over to sunflower. That's where it's being derived from now. Yeah, instead of cow brain. Yeah, that that sounds a lot less uh, <laughs> gruesome for people than yeah. cow brain. Oh, Good poor cow. Um, what else? Um, there's something called pycnogenol, which is a an extract from uh, like pine tree bark, which is an, another adaptogen compound that has a lot of um sort of generalized benefits. I mean that that seems to be sort of one of the common themes when I talk with people about adaptogens is that it's very tough to pin down exactly what the active ingredient in some of these things are because there can be you know dozens or hundreds of biochemically active compounds in any one plant and of course depending on the strain of plants since these are living things it can it can vary from one plant to the next and then depending on what the the filtration and extraction techniques are um, you know one batch to the next even if it's the same plants can really have different um, different properties once you get it into whatever form you're going to ingest it through right that's interesting I haven't actually tried w- how did you say that again pycnogenol pycnogenol yeah and, that, and that's pine bark extract yeah it's a it's a specific kind of pine tree that grows in the uh, the, the south of France I believe um, which sa- sounds so uh, so exotic it does but, uh, <laughs> so not just the uh, the Oregonian pines or whatever that we right. have out in the backyard here that's great and so I've heard now I have heard about using you know pine pollen but I haven't heard of pine bark is that I wonder does that help specifically for any type like you know certain things like I would say rhodiola is a great adaptogen slash antidepressant anti-stress is this more of something to do with maybe like physical performance i've heard things about testosterone and and, and pine pollen i don't know if that's completely unrelated or not yeah I, I can't i can't remember having any any particular um you know hormonal effects on on, on things like testosterone for that it, it was generally considered it was a little bit of a mood booster it was a little bit of a um it, i mean actually it was a significant anti-inflammatory um that was that was probably the main thing that had going for it um got it that's great okay so that's number two helps because inflammation inflammation is never a good thing yeah i know Um, i know i put you on the spot here no bacopa maneri would be another one um it's an indian herb which has been used for a long 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 time i guess everything in india kind of falls into that category but it uh, seems to generally have benefits in memory and is uh Used really pretty widely in India, and, and I think that's uh, actually curcumin would be another one, um, which is a spice. Um, I believe curcumin is a biochemical precursor to. Uh, mm, I feel like it's acetylcholine, but I'm not. I wouldn't want to stake my life on that. Right. Yeah, that's another naturally occurring compound um, with memory benefits. Now, one of the interesting things about India, sort of that that whole you know subcontinent region is that despite the fact that there's, you know, a, a ton of people and, um, you know, oftentimes some, some fairly, you know, bad living conditions as far as, you know, physical health, is that they don't have a ton of Alzheimer's and they don't seem to have as many memory issues for people uh, late in life there. And it's, it's speculated that the curcumin and bacopa, because those are a, you know, fairly extensive part of the traditional diet, might be a big reason for that. And, and bacopa in particular has, has borne out well in memory studies. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely in the 
epidemic in the states of Alzheimer's and other brain degeneration. So that would be amazing to think what would happen if everybody just started to add a couple teaspoons of, you know, curcumin to their to their diet. Yeah, and again, that's along with lemon balm. That's the only other uh, you know tasty one that I can think of. It, it's interesting if, uh, to veer off for a second onto um, you know, the idea of sort of the, the aging baby boomer generation and the effects that that's going to have. On the one hand, you know, obviously it, it's it's terrible thinking about the number of Alzheimer's patients you know tripling over the course of the next fifteen years, which I, I believe is what a lot of people are expecting. But the if there's a, a sort of a silver lining to that dark cloud. It's that a lot of the cognitive enhancement drugs that we do have now are sort of hand-me-downs from people looking for ways to stave off senile dementia and Alzheimer's and things like that that are you know typically late-in-life problems. And it turns out that some of these same compounds that are helpful for those people can also be used, not normally with as great an effect, but still with some effect, for people that are still in their cognitive primes much younger in life. So um, you know, I, I think it stands to reason that as more research is done to you know, help people maintain their brains as there's a significant aging population that we might get some good follow-on benefits for everybody else, um, you know, even people that are far younger. Man, I appreciate that positive outlook. That is great because I think about that too. I mean, I'm really close with my grandparents and you see some of their friends that are approaching their 80s or mid-80s and there's a guy across the street from them that has Alzheimer's and he's just losing it and it's like, oh my gosh, I mean, how are we going to keep up with the economy? How How are we going to support this massively growing beast that is some form of mental disability and people think like oh i'm in my 20s or 30s or 40s and you know i'll worry about that when i get there but you know you and i both are talking about this sort of preventative maintenance of the brain and it's like how about we focus on being the top one percent of optimal performers now that's really going to help us to be more productive now as opposed to waiting i don't think that weight method works that that well yeah the, one of the um one of the interviews that I had that really stuck with me, this was one of the very early ones, was it was described how one should think of sort of their overall cognitive performance over the course of their lifetime. And, and the idea was that we kind of have a ceiling that is lowering over us, that sort of the, um, you know, the upper bounds of our cognition for our entire life. It starts out when you're young, you've got all this, you know, it's sort of, you're overflowing with brain cells and they all work pretty well. They're all pretty healthy. You know, they're, they're firing, you know, they're listening to one another, all that stuff. Um, but as you make lifestyle choices, like, you know what, I'm going to eat this bag of Fritos instead of a healthy meal, or you know what, I'm going to drink a bunch of alcohol, or I'm going to not exercise, or these things, you know, everybody is having sort of this, you know, cognitive ceiling lower towards them for their entire life. But depending on the lifestyle choices, the ceiling may be lowering, uh, you know, either more quickly or more slowly. But you're, you're never aware of this ceiling lowering until it hits you in the forehead, and all of a sudden there's not enough room to stand up. And, and for, for most people, um, you know, that might start to happen. Their, their cognitive processes might start to visibly slow down in their 60s or 70s. If you sort of keep a very well-maintained brain, you can stave that off a lot longer. And of course, if you make some you know, disastrous personal health choices, you can certainly accelerate that process. And, you know, even by your you know, late 40s, early 50s, really start having some big problems. I mean, you know, people that are uh, like habitual alcoholics, you know, they have these things where they have like worse than Alzheimer's level memory loss, which can happen, you know, pretty much any time. It just depends on, you know, how many gallons of booze you're putting down your throat. Right. So um, sort of thinking about that, like slowly lowering cognitive ceiling and what you can do to, uh, you know, decelerate that process as much as possible, I, I think is a really powerful metaphor. That's great. So, I mean, supplements and all this stuff we talked about is definitely one tool that you and I both use in our toolbox. What other tools do you talk about or do you use in your personal life that helps you to elevate that ceiling? Um, well, I, I think, you know, diet and exercise are probably the main ones um, that, you know, everybody's aware of. It's, it's one of these things that's easy to understand, tough to implement sometimes. I mean, I, exercise, I feel like, is probably better understood or at least better agreed upon by the experts that any exercise is better than no exercise. You know, getting you know, strapping on the pedometer and making sure you're getting a certain number of steps per day certainly has a ton of benefits. Um, I just read a book recently, actually, on, um, it was called Get Up, How Your Chair is Killing You, and, and just made some some profoundly, you know, scary things about how, how sitting um, can really be dangerous long term. And I've, I've started doing quite a bit more 
intentional walking sense than just like, you know, walk into the grocery store and even instead of riding my bike just because it takes longer and there's actually more uh, more minutes that you're putting into some low level physical activity. So I, I think, um, you know, th there's a lot of benefits, obviously, to intense workouts, things like strength training. Uh, but there's also a lot of benefits just to um, putting in as many minutes per day as possible in low level physical activity, you know, walking, shuffling about rather than being completely sedentary. On the diet side, um, you know, I, I know you've got a, a ton of background and in, in information here also. What's interesting is that um, there's a lot less agreement among nutritionists about what the proper human diet actually is. I mean, the number of diet books out there attests to that. What it, what it seems like to me, having, having looked at several different diets over the course of my life, is that the, um, the standard American diet is almost like the center spoke in a wheel that's like the absolute worst place you can be. It's, it's where, you, where you don't want to go. And anything that you're doing to, uh, to venture out from that central spoke of this standard American diet is probably a good thing. I think there's a lot more to be said for uh, you know, th things like you know, veganism on the one side or uh, meat-heavy paleo or, or ketogenic diet on the other side. Even though they seem very different, I think either of them are going to have probably better uh, long-term outcomes than you know, staying in the middle with a bag of potato chips. I agree. Yeah. I, I looked up that book. So that's Dr. James. I was thinking that book, it sounded a lot like another one called Get It Up. There's a guy that may be an interesting uh, <laughs> seller show. <laughs> it's actually about your bed and elevating your bed to what, you know, he talks about increasing cognitive performance by elevating your bed a little bit because you're allowing your lymph system to flow better and things like that. I don't know, t t t tangential, but crazy. Yeah, no, I've, I've actually read about that. And this is not elevating your entire bed uh, evenly, but basically lifting the head side yes. a little bit. So you're like a, a 10 inches higher um, where your head is versus where your feet are located. I thought that was really interesting. And it seems like one of these things where you might as well try it because there's almost no downside. And as long as you're not you know, scared of like sliding off the bottom of your bed and embarrassing yourself, um, it, it, it just seems like such an easy thing to try that you know, if he's right, great. And if he's not, um, you know, there's, there's probably no <laughs> harm in it. I remember from going camping as a kid uh, and sometimes, you know, sleeping the wrong way, sleeping on a reverse incline where your feet are lower than your head. I, I never slept well that way and, and learned to uh, always, you know, incline myself if possible so my head was slightly uphill. Right. Yeah, I know. Well, I guess the idea is that we slept ancestrally, you know, sort of in maybe hammocks. I mean, that would have been certainly modern humans sleeping in hammocks where you'd have that elevation like that. My wife and I tried it. We got some of those blocks, just the blocks where you would pull the bed off the floor so you can stuff a bunch of your garbage beneath the, you know, a bunch of your clutter beneath the bed. So we used it and elevated the top half of the bed, but we both couldn't sleep that good the first night. So she uh, didn't have enough inspiration, not, nor did I to continue, but it was definitely a, you know, a fun idea. Yeah. I, I think tweaking around with some of these different experimental things and just kind of seeing how they, they strike you personally is, is great. Um, I, I think it's good for people also to kind of get in the habit of just, just realizing that they can shake up their routine. Just because you do shake up your routine and try something new doesn't mean it's necessarily going to stick. But um, you know, r routine in itself you know, has dangers. I think it, it's a bad personal habit. It's a bad cognitive habit, certainly. And it, it's kind of cool just to try out some new things every now and then. I'm not sure when this episode is going to come out, but um, you know, as we're recording this, it's a, a few days before Christmas. So if people are looking for, for you know, something for a New Year's resolution and you haven't picked it yet, I'm not, I'm not a giant fan of resolutions for the sake of resolutions. But I do think um, you know, if you don't do a New Year's resolution, then maybe think about a New Year's experiment could be a fun idea. Just, you know, something that you've been curious about and want to give like a 30 day challenge to. That's a great idea. Now, was there a time where, and I'm sure if the amount of stuff that, and I don't necessarily specifically focus on always nootropics on the podcast, but I've definitely covered it a lot. And I've had dozens of packages come to my doors from various companies. Hey, please try this. I'm sure you've had the same. Were there any times where you took something and you're like, oh my God, I'm on the ride. How many hours is it going to take to get off this thing? Oh, no. I, yeah, um, something that was just overcharged, like a, a, some extreme stimulant that you're uh, just feeling like you want, to, you want to get off the bucking bronco. Yeah, I mean, something like that. Or, or you know, there's so many different effects that you can have. But, yeah, that could definitely be one that's not fun. Yeah, I, I can't say that I've had a, um, you know, an experience like that with where somebody has sent me a compound to try. Um, 
that has, has overwhelmed me in that way. I mean, most of the times when I've felt overstimulated have, have honestly been caffeine related as weird as that is just, um, there, I did try on, on one episode of my show a couple of months ago, a friend of mine who has an, uh, a Ritalin prescription, methylphenidate, sent me um, two methylphenidate capsules, which I'd never tried before. And I kind of just you know popped them in the name of science, not, not both of them at the same time. I popped <laughs> one for the episode, but one day's worth of like an adult man's amount of, of methylphenidate. And that definitely kind of had that sense. I, did, I didn't want to get off the ride. I wasn't, you know, I want to take my ball and go home. But it did feel like it was too much energy, probably too much dopamine flowing through my system or at least, you know, being accessible by my brain at once. I had this, um, you know, probably for the, my first and only time with nootropics on that particular compound, I, I felt this strong sense of motivation to do something. And yet when I, when I did things, I mean, I, I sort of had a normal work day, I didn't feel you know, what I called a, a biochemical pat on the head for having performed. I didn't feel, um, like it, it alleviated my um, my sense of urgency to actually be doing work, which was was weird. It was kind of like I'm doing the work. Why am I not feeling a, a relief in stress as a result of the work getting done? Um, so yeah, that that might probably be my uh, strongest uh, anxiety reaction, maybe from any any um, you know nootropic compound that I've tried. Not not that actually would methylphenidate I would count as a nootropic. It, is a cognitive enhancer certainly, but I don't think meets the uh, stricter definition for nootropic. Exactly. Break that down for people before we wrap this up, because a lot of people they may have tuned in, and here we are, thirty minutes later, and they're like, "Wait, what's a what's a nootropic?" So maybe you could or nootropic, however you want to say it. Yeah. Um. So, so okay. <laughs> the the etymology of this word goes back to a Greek word uh, spelled n o o s, which basically means mind. I think in, in, if you were, had a Greek scholar here, they would say it's pronounced something like nuos with almost like two, uh, two syllables there. But most people are going to say nootropic, just, you know, sort of simple American pronunciation. And um, nootropic was a term coined by the original inventor of a compound called paracetam. Um, people probably have heard of a, a chemical family called the racetams. They all have the suffix racetam, or at least most of them do. But paracetam was the original it was also the original thing considered a nootropic by its inventor. And, and he coined this term saying that it, a, a nootropic would be a compound that has cognitively beneficial effects, is neuroprotective, that you do not build up a tolerance to, that you don't get addicted to, and that has no uh, you know, negative physical uh, effects from it. So, so basically, those five, I'm, I'm pretty sure those are the five criteria. And Anything that fits that description is kind of a wonder drug. I mean, something that makes you smarter, that you don't build up a tolerance to. It's like, wow, that sounds fantastic. So something like caffeine, for example, which most people are going to be familiar with, it's a cognitive enhancer, sure, but it wouldn't count as a nootropic because people do build up a tolerance to it to a certain extent. Um, and they certainly can build up a dependency to it. You know, the famous caffeine headaches and, and feeling kind of crummy if you have built up a caffeine addiction and then you go without caffeine. So, um, you know, I like to use the term, you know, smart drug or cognitive enhancer, which I feel is like a safe general umbrella that talks about these things that, you know, at least temporarily will uptick your cognition. Whereas I sort of try to hold a, a more, you know, slightly reserved ground, hallowed ground for the term nootropic, because really, if there's any sort of definitive negative uh, effect at all, you really shouldn't apply the nootropic terminology. However, we, the major asterisk there is when people are looking around on the internet, you're going to see the term nootropic thrown around willy-nilly applied to all kinds of stuff that doesn't meet that stricter definition. I know. That's the hard part about it. That's what I had to outline in my book. Like, look, I'm going to talk about some stuff that may not be considered nootropics, but they are lumped into that category because the term has been so watered down and diluted. Yeah, you know what? We can shift into a quick dietary analogy because I think this is just a hilarious little historical anecdote. But originally, what we, so, so vegans, as probably everybody knows, are people that don't eat any sort of animal food. It's like they don't eat eggs. Um, I don't. I think if you're a strict vegan, you don't even eat bee pollen because it comes from the labor of bees. So it, it's 
completely non-animal is, is what we now call veganism. Or as vegetarians, we give a much laxer definition. We allow them generally to eat eggs because an egg hasn't been fertilized yet and yada, yada, yada. There are some people that are like, you know, they say, well, I'm a vegetarian, but I eat some fish too. And they still consider themselves a vegetarian because I guess they're not eating red meat or animals with a backbone or so, something like that. Um, anyway, so, so originally, like 50 years ago, what we now call vegans were called vegetarians. But more and more people kind of started giving themselves uh, more laxity and calling themselves vegetarians, even though they weren't strict vegetarians, to the point where the number of sort of you know faux vegetarians completely outnumbered the stricter ones, and and the strict vegetarians kind of had to give up the word. They had to retreat and make up this new word called vegan and kind of hold the line there because they couldn't hold the line on the broader term. And I kind of feel like something similar might really happen with nootropics. It, it might be that we need to make up a new word for these things that don't have. A, um, you know, any, any sort of physiological downsides and just kind of give up the word nootropic to the mainstream. <laughs> That's hilarious, but it's so true. Yeah, we're, we're at that point now. It's just a matter of when this hits the mainstream. I'd say you and I are, and everybody listening are in these this sort of bubble here where we're in the Wild West, but as this gets to the mainstream, that there probably will have to be a new term for the original adopters, so to speak, because, I mean, yeah. you know, eventually you're going to get vitamin C be considered a nootropic or something crazy. Exactly. We can say, you know, I, I was into chemical cognitive enhancers before they were cool and, you know, just shake our fists at these, you know, the, the newcomers or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, th there certainly will be, I think, the um, the Flintstones multivitamin equivalent of, a, a, you know, a nootropic or a cognitive enhancer sometime in the next five or 10 years. It'll start be something that, um, you know, some of these compounds will probably be covered on your uh, your health care costs that you get through your you know, business that you work for, things like that. That's an exciting concept. So you think that is on the that is on the horizon? Well, I mean, it just seems like the the public awareness of these compounds is growing at. I, I hate to overuse the term exponential because I feel like it's something that is dropped too frequently on things that aren't really exponential, but it's certainly uh, growing quite a bit over the course of the last couple of years, and I think seeping into public consciousness more and more. And we've also we're in a culture now where. Um, this Silicon Valley is really someplace where a lot of people are looking to for, for cultural inspiration. And Silicon Valley, you know, obviously um, a lot of software people there, the overlap between people that are into nootropics and cognitive enhancers and people that are, are writing software is really large. So I just kind of think that it's it's something which has a lot of reasons why it's going to continue to get into the, the cultural mainstream. There's also major projects both in the U.S. and Europe looking at um, – you know, the human brain, and we're, we're gaining information about the human brain at an accelerating rate that's very similar to what was going on in the 90s with, um, you know, breaking down the human genetic code with the Human Genome Project. And, and so I just think that all this confluence of factors of people, um, you know, being interested in their brains and being able to get data back about their brains in ways that they were never able to before is going to, you know, lead to the natural next question of, okay, I know all this stuff about brains in general, what can I do to help mine in particular? Agreed. Yeah, that's exciting. Well, cool. Well, if you had a last word for people, maybe something that they can do, maybe completely unrelated to nootropics, something you think is going to improve people's outlook or their perception on life or their experience on this planet, what would you recommend to them? Hmm, well, it's a, a broad question, but I, I guess I'll kind of go back to that idea of um, – you know, keeping your curiosity really open and doing some some you know minor self experiments. This doesn't necessarily mean being Doctor Frankenstein and drinking bubbling stuff out of a beaker every thirty days, but um you know just thinking about different things that you can try in your life that you might have been curious about that maybe you've heard about some other people that have had success with, and you know trying to apply those things in your own life, seeing what works and what doesn't, and and shaking up your routine every now and then. I really feel like from a, a cognitive perspective. Routine is one of the most dangerous things that most of us deal with, and um, you know, just you know, shaking off the dust every now and then is really a good thing. I second that advice. That's great advice. Yeah, because I mean, if if you're not familiar with with what that means, I mean, if you wake up and you think the same thoughts and you drive the same way to work every single day, you eat with the same people, you drive home the same way, you wear the same clothes, you go to the same grocery, you never 
had any new input. I mean, it's so easy for everything. And you're a lot easier to kidnap too. If anybody's trying to kidnap you and you have that routine, you're going to get kidnapped. Too. <laughs> really? Really? But you you know, on a, on a brain perspective, you just, you go into autopilot and there's not really room for new neurons to fire and grow and to create these new synapses and connections in the brain where you're like, oh man, there's, there, there's new things, there's new possibilities. And I think you're totally alluding to that is that there's so much possibility and things that you can achieve if you break out of the mold that you've created for yourself. Oftentimes it's a mold by, you know, created by society or media or whatever that puts you into this, this box. But as you do pull yourself out of that, there is limitless possibility for what you can really achieve and what you can do in life. I mean, you're a, you're a world, a world traveler, you know what I mean? And and you enable yourself to do that. You don't have to be told or allowed to do it. You just create the life that you want. I think that's really inspiring. It, it was one of those things that uh, you know really derived from curiosity. It was I was curious about seeing more parts of the world, and I started thinking, you know, how can I kind of design my life and the work that I do in a way that will allow me to, uh, you know, not just travel for vacation, but travel while sort of maintaining my livelihood. And I mean, you know, these are everything has trade offs. But um, I, I just think it's good for people to be aware of these trade-offs. And, and like you said, um, one of the great things that we've learned that's been very promising about the brain in the last you know, 15 or 20 years is that neurogenesis is going on even in adults all the time. We're creating new brain cells, and we can do things to you know, accelerate or decelerate that process with you know, things like exercise and food choices and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we also all constantly have synaptic pruning. You know, if, you're, if you're not using certain brain cells or certain connections between different areas of your brain – your brain is an efficient machine and it's like, hey, you know what? This uh, neural pathway hasn't been fired in a while. Let's, let's stop you know, repairing its melanin or uh, uh, myelin sheaths when it breaks down and things like that. And, and so you want to just be aware of both these processes that you have pruning going on, you have neurogenesis going on, and, and kind of you, know, you should be rooting for the home team of the, the, home team of the neurogenesis and, and not allow um, you know, synaptic pruning that you don't want by letting your brain get stagnant. Exactly. That's that's a great way to put it. Well, we'll send people back to your podcast, Smart Drug Smarts. They can check it out on iTunes or they can go directly to your website, Smart Drug Smarts. There's tons of cool info there and just geek out. Spend some time looking at all of these episodes. There's different categories here of different topics. I love the lemon balm episode, so I would recommend starting there as a, as a starter. Uh, well, tell you what, I'll, I'll put together a page, a landing page. Uh, we'll do smartdrugsmarts.com slash Evan Brand. And we can give a couple of your favorite episodes. I'll, I'll talk with you. We can figure out what those are, but maybe like your top two or three and direct people specifically to those. That's a great idea. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that you want to let people know before we end this thing? Um, no, I think that's it for now. But yeah, directing them over to the website would be great and just really appreciate your time. I love talking about this stuff. Same here. All right, take care. Okay, you too. Bye. All right, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And like I mentioned in the beginning... You can get the Everything Guide to Nootropics, my book, on Amazon. It's now released to where you can get it. It's definitely something you want to have on your shelf, and it's definitely reasonably priced, and that price is determined by the publishing company themselves. Two last things here. If you are looking to start your own health blog, visit my website. I put up a free article, a free guide, step-by-step -step of how to start your own blog. That's back at the website, not just paleo.com. You'll see it in the menu bar under resources, how to start a blog. I get that question all the time, so I figured I would address it here on the podcast. And then lastly, and most importantly, to schedule your free consult with myself. Once you're at the website, just click work with Evan in the menu bar, and you will get access to my calendar, and you can schedule yourself. It's fun. I talk to people every single week around the world, and they always say, how easy it is for them to talk with me because it's like, oh, I already know you. And that's so easy and great for me as a clinician to help you get better faster because you don't have a wall up, right? Most of the time you have to get to know people. You got to get comfortable with each other first, and then you can get results. And this way, we don't have to do any of that. We cut straight to the chase and get to the root cause of your issues. So that's really fun and a true blessing for me that I can reach out to you all via this podcast Thanks for tuning in. I'll talk with you soon, and enjoy your holiday. Bye-bye. He acts like it's all good, yeah, like everything's cool. Kiss a girl tonight, and then he leaves her. She doesn't have a clue that he's terrible rules. 
Why I'm in a tire that I watch out, girl. Don't wanna see a fire eyes out, girl. Cause I've been watching, you've been hurting. Let me be the one that loves you better. For the past several months, how do I start my own blog? Most of the time, I just refer people back to my membership website, healthbloggerpro.com. That way, you can start, grow, and monetize your own health website if that's your goal. If you want to write ebooks, if you want to learn how to create a podcast, you want to learn how I edit the show, if you want to learn how to do some video production, whatever it is, that's all inside of the membership site, healthbloggerpro.com. So, that's it for my pitches here. I will talk to you next week. Once again, have a great Christmas and a new year. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. He acts like it's all good, yeah, like everything's cool. Kiss a dog and I never leaves her. She doesn't have a clue that he's terrible blues. Why I'm in the tire, got to watch out, girl. Don't want to see her by her eyes out, girl. Cause I've been watching, you've been hurting. Let me be the one 